G'day everyone, welcome back to True Footy. Uh, it has come to my attention there are new rules announced for trade period stuff and drafts and academies. It was announced uh, you know, yesterday, I think, and in today's video, we're just gonna unpack what's been said and the effect it's going to have both on this trade period and in future trade periods as well. Before we get into it, if you could do me a favor, it would mean a lot to me if you did consider subscribing to this footy channel. We cover all sorts of footy topics throughout the year and we'll be covering very closely the AFL trade and draft period space as well. I'm also within about 20 of getting to 29,000 subscribers and I'd love to hit 30,000 by grand final day. That's my goal. So if you're enjoying the content, it would mean a lot to me if you did. All right, let's get into this video. Okay, significant changes to the Academy and Father-Son bidding point system will be introduced in 2025. There are some changes this year to be aware of as well. And uh, if you're not aware, this has been bubbling away for a little while, a lot of tension around, um, you know, the Academy system and how, you know, a few years ago, you could match a next generation Academy bid as early as pick one. We saw that with Jamari Eugle Hagen, the AFL snapped back and meant that no club could match a bid in the top 20 of a draft. And then it became the top 40. Now they seem to have gone back on that as we'll unpack. So it says the number of changes won't be introduced until 2025, but there are some changes for this year. And I think 2025, is really referring to the point system which is being adjusted. So if you're unaware, every pick has a calculated points value, which is a little bit arbitrary, but nonetheless, it was set and we've been going off that system for a while now and it seems like that is going to be rejigged. And again, we will go through that. So as this article points out, there was talk of changing the point system as early as this year and there are strong reasons against that. So specifically, you know, there's clubs like this article suggests, uh, Brisbane have Levi Ashcroft, uh, and Sam Marshall, one's a father-son, one's a Northern Academy player. Carlton have the Camperioli twins, um, and you know Richmond have made a number of plays to get picks in this year's draft. Essentially, clubs who did trades last year, preparing for the 2024 draft and trade period, if the AFL had made meaningful changes to the way points were calculated and changed the rules too much this year, all of those clubs would be screwed over with respect to their trades last year, in particular Richmond. Richmond did a number of live trades last year to make sure they had enough points to be able to capitalize on this system this year. If the AFL had changed it this year, Richmond might have been screwed over. So let's get straight into it. There are changes as early as this year. Let's be specific. Clubs will now have access from pick one for NGA prospects. So that is in line again with what happened in 2020 when uh, the Western Bulldogs were able to match a bid at pick one for Jamari Yugo Hagen. This is now in line with Northern Academy and Father Son bidding. So if you're unaware, the Northern clubs, so Brisbane, Gold Coast, GWS, and the Sydney Swans have their own Northern Academies. Different rules applied to them and they could match a bid at pick one in theory. The same applied for Father Son selections as we saw with uh, 2021 and Nick Dacos and Will Ashcroft in 2022. Now next generation academies, they've reverted back to all being on the same system. AFL will continue to run its review on changing the next generation academy zones ahead of Tasmania's entrance. Okay, that makes sense. I suppose more teams, you've got to divvy uh, div it up a little bit differently. Uh, the eligibility and sign up process is important. So I suppose the danger you have with next generation academy talents is, sure, if a club has put resources in and developing a player to be worthy of pick one, they should have access to him. If they don't have the right to match a bid in the top 40 selections, it massively disincentivizes them investing in this academy. What you wanna be mindful of is when players join an academy, but were already good footballers or always going through talent pathways to get there. So, you know, in terms of eligibility and sign up process, this is vague and doesn't clarify that, but that's probably where it gets murky. Free agency compensation picks will now take into account contract length as a determining factor. However, contracts less than two years or more than five will not be given any weight. As I suppose it means like whether it's five or whether it's eight, they won't make any difference. The league will be more transparent with its free agency compensation formula. Okay, that's good. But I will put it as an aside, I thought it already was a factor. I thought it did matter if a player was getting a four-year deal at his new club or a six-year deal or a two-year deal. Evidently not. I suppose it was on some other secret factors, probably just, you know, the monetary size of the contract and I think best and fairest um, rankings, etc. This is an interesting one here. Clubs will be able to retain rookies for up to a maximum of five years, up from the current three years. So if a player's on your rookie list, Previously, you could have them on a max for three years. That's not going up to five. That's interesting. And as a West Coast fan, that is actually probably something that we might you know, benefit from this year. The idea is to give clubs more time to develop key position players. That makes sense. If you, if you pick like a prospect from regional Western Australia or something like that, like a Jeremy McGovern who came from Albany, Jeremy McGovern took like three years to be able to get a game at West Coast. Giving clubs a little bit more freedom to sign them up for longer and let them develop longer uh, does have some benefit, but there is a stipulation that you can't have played more than 10 games 
at the end of the fourth or fifth season to retain rookie status. That makes sense. More flexibility in the drafting of father-son prospects as either primary listed or rookie listed players. Current rules mean clubs have to nominate before the draft, uh, but this gives you more scope to make decisions during the live draft. So if you haven't nominated a player as a father-son, you can do that in the middle of the draft. That's interesting. So those are the changes this year, and it means that clubs like Richmond, Adelaide, and the Brisbane Lions, and Carlton, who all have a vested interest in this year's draft, can breathe a little bit easier because the rules that were the case last year for like father sons and Northern Academy players, that's not affected by point value changing. So let's get into 2025. The revised draft value index and bidding system will be introduced. So they're changing it. The new DVI will make it harder for clubs to stockpile draft selections to match multiple bids on academy and father son selection. So you can see why Richmond who have like heaps of seconds, thirds and fourths would have been screwed over massively if those no longer have the same tra trade value as it did. The 20% points discount applied to match bids will be reduced to 10%. However, the AFL will continue to review this and assess whether it should apply to all or some of father son NGA Northern Academy players. That's interesting. So currently points values are only attached to the first 73 picks. Pick 74 has zero value. That is dropping down to 54. So anything after pick 54 has no value and there's no benefit to, you know, even someone like a Richmond, if they had picks 56, 57, 58, they wouldn't be able to trade them to a Brisbane or a Gold Coast um, because they'd have literally zero value in terms of matching an academy bid. But again, this is 2025, remember. And future trading of picks will be extended to two years in advance. This is significant. This really does allow some flexibility of players to move clubs. Now we do see that players still move clubs. I don't think there's too many deals that have fallen through for this reason. And it probably does, probably it does allow clubs to get compensated more fairly, right? It just gives more options for a deal to get done. You know, back in the day, you couldn't trade future picks at all. You just have to accept whatever that club's best pick was. Future picks in advance gives a lot more flexibility and a lot more potential for deals to be get done. And now we're talking about 2026, okay? Live trading will be introduced for the 2026 mid-season rookie draft. I don't know why that's pushed so far into the future. This allows clubs to move it up and down the order into the draft using end of year selections. So yeah, that's cool. I mean, the mid-season draft can be very hit and miss. There's usually one or two good players a year. So I don't know what real tangible effect this will have. I suppose what you might be looking at, you see there's a club in the premiership race who you know really want the best key position defender that's tearing it up in the VFL and they've had an ACL, they can trade, you know, whatever selection they deem it worth with whoever's last at the time for pick one in the mid-season draft. And then that club presumably picks last in the mid-season draft, not first, but gets an end, better end of year selection. End of year selections are probably worth a little bit more. So that's interesting. Again, I'm not sure why that's 2026. But nonetheless, that's happening. It says here at the end, after Jamari Hagen was the number one pick as a Western Bulldogs NGA player in 2020, the AFL changed the rules so that clubs couldn't match NGA bids in the top 20 and then the top 40. So I already mentioned that already. So that's that's interesting because there are clubs who have missed out on really good players. So Melbourne's missed out on Mac Andrew in 2021, I want to say it was. He was an NGA player, but he went pick six, uh, which was, at the time was in the top 20, obviously. And Gold Coast snapped him up. And then I want to say, you know, there was also Jesse Motlop who would have gone or could have gone to Fremantle under the current rules now that they've changed. He's obviously gone to Carlton. West Coast missed out on Lance Collard last year, and I'm sure you can find heaps of examples. Cam McKenzie, I think, might have been a St. Kilda NGA uh, as recently as 2022. So uh, it's just shit luck for all of those clubs, I suppose. There is also an impact this year. Isaac Carco is a first round prospect, potential top 15, it says here. Essendon can match any bid in the draft for him, which is interesting. So in my last Phantom draft, I actually got picked up for that. I didn't actually know these rules were coming. I do now, and I think they've now just been made official. But the next Phantom draft, I won't have Essendon taking their own next generation academy player because they'll be able to match a bid. Now that's also bringing up something for Essendon. Now they've got to accumulate points because there was no chance of him lasting past pick 40, which was the current rules until they changed it. So it's good news for Essendon. They can get Isaac Carco and potentially their own first rounder, depending on where exactly Carco goes. Now they have to think about points for next year. So this is another team that could potentially be on the hunt for Richmond's picks this year. So there you have it, guys. Some rule changes to cover off. Um, and it's interesting the impact it's going to have on this year. I'm glad that clubs didn't get screwed over, to be honest. I think that would have been high level incompetence for the AFL if they'd done that to clubs that had made plans for 2024 only to sweep the rug from under them as for the next generation academy stuff again uh, I think it's just the way football's going the AFL is wanting to incentivize the investment in next gener generation academies which are focused on developing talent uh, pathways in particular you know players from like rural indigenous communities and, and I think you know international or non-Australian selections so like uh, I think Machida Owens is he Japanese or something like that I think Jordan Baker from West Coast is Singaporean. So, 
you know, talents of that nature, the AFL is wanting to incentivize that, grow the overall talent pool. So it is what it is. And that is the effect it will have on this year. And uh, yeah, everyone who supports a team who has a Next Generation Academy player, um, the, the odds of that player getting to your club now have just gone through the roof. But let me know in the comments what you think of these rule changes. I hope I went through that as well as I possibly could. I hope it wasn't too confusing for those who aren't as in touch with the AFL rules. Let me know if you have any questions about any of that as well in the comment section. I'll do my best to answer them. And for now, I'll thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.